When I got to the Steelers, I was kind of shocked because growing up, I was focused on, I want to be a good player. And now I got to the highest level of the sport and I saw all of these Christian guys on the team and that uh, Christian walk was important to them. And it, it really kind of blew me away, but it, it made me realize that what my mom said was true. It's not what you do in life, it's how you do it and who you're doing it for. And these guys were doing it for the Lord and it made a big impact on me. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. The world tells us we need to be winning, whether it's in our careers, our hobbies, or being the best parent, grandparent, etc. Social media is laced with the best and brightest of our moments, where losing doesn't even seem like something we're allowed to acknowledge. One of the winningest coaches in the NFL, Coach Tony Dungy, and successful NFL linebacker Sam Ocho have had their share of wins, but they also know that doesn't bring them what they need most in life. Only Jesus can do that. Coach Tony Dungy is known for his groundbreaking presence on the football field during his tenure as a player and as a coach, quietly pioneering his way through a 28-year career to become one of the winningest coaches in the NFL, the first coach ever to defeat all 32 NFL teams, and also the first African-American head coach to win a Super Bowl. But he is also known for holding his faith and his family first, even as he continued to collect accolades and establish firsts in the game of football. Now retired from the NFL, Tony has turned his attention to helping organizations like the National Fatherhood Program, All Pro Dad, and is a prolific broadcaster for NFL games, all the while sharing the source of his winning ways, his unwavering commitment to Christ. Hi, I'm Tony Dungy. I coached 28 years in the National Football League, and uh, for the past 12 years, I've been an analyst for NBC Football Night in America and Sunday Night Football, and I'm doing that and loving life. We have 10 children, my wife Lauren and I, and we live in Tampa, Florida. I, I wouldn't trade my upbringing for anything in the world. I grew up in a little small industrial town, Jackson, Michigan, and uh, just was in a beautiful family. My mom and dad were both teachers. My dad taught college biology and zoology. My mom was a high school English and public speaking teacher. Uh, my mom also doubled as the uh, Bible study, or excuse me, the Sunday school teacher uh, for our church. Uh, my grandfather was a minister. Two of my uncles, my dad's brothers, were ministers. So I grew up hearing about the gospel from the time I, I can remember. And I can remember my mom as I was a little kid, you know, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? That's the kind of uh, upbringing I had. Uh, they also talked about doing things the right way and helping people. So I accepted Christ as a really young boy. You know, hey, do you want to go to heaven? Absolutely. I put my hand up. What do I need to do? And uh, I, I can remember that very clearly. But like a lot of young boys at that time, uh, sports kind of became my hero or my idol. And I, of course, I had to be a good student so I could please my parents. So I, that became kind of my MO. I'm going to be a good student. I'm going to be a good athlete. I'm going to try to go to college. Uh, a lot of my focus was on that. And so all the way, I think, through middle school and high school and even uh, college, People saw me, they wouldn't necessarily have said Christian, but they would have said nice guy, good kid, hard worker, all of those things. But that changed for me when I went to the NFL. Uh, when I was young, I never thought about playing in the NFL. I, I just played because I liked it. Then I got to the University of Minnesota, got a scholarship. Still didn't think about professional football as a career. Uh, but then my senior year in college, I started thinking, maybe I have a chance to do this. This is something I would enjoy, and maybe I'm going to be good enough. Uh, well, then when I did get to the Steelers, then I put my own plan into focus in my mind. Okay, I'll play maybe 10 years. We'll win three or four Super Bowls. I'll make enough money to start my own business. I'm a business administration major. I'll have this nest egg, and then I'll live happily ever after. And it, it didn't work that way. And, I was 21 years old, went to the Pittsburgh Steelers, and my coach there was a guy named Chuck Knoll. And the first meeting we had, uh, he welcomed everybody to the team, the new guys, and he said, welcome to the National Football League. 
you're now getting paid to play football, so that makes it your profession. But please, please don't make football your whole life. And I remember I was writing that down and saying, wait a minute, this sounds like my mother. And it, it hit home to me uh, that here was this man that had won two Super Bowls already, and he was saying, don't make football your whole life. And what Coach Knowles said was true. You can't pour everything into football. Uh, after my third year, I had been traded a couple of times, got released, and now I was 25 years old and basically done with my career. I didn't know it at the time, but uh, uh, no other team was going to call. And so I'm sitting there thinking, what am I going to do now? I didn't play long enough to get this nest egg. I've got to get a real job. What am I going to do? And the phone rang and it was Coach Noel calling and, and saying, I think you have an aptitude for the game. You're, you're a good communicator. I think you could be a good coach if you would like. I've, I've got to, we'll create an opening on our staff. And at that time, uh, I think there were only 10 African-American coaches in the entire National Football League. No head coaches and only 10 assistants. So there weren't a lot of role models. It wasn't something I thought about. And um, I just, looking back on it now, I know the Lord was preparing me, uh, but that's how I got into it. And it certainly wasn't something that I thought I would do, but God, I think, had that plan. And I remember going to work and the first day being there and just being so excited. This was you know, something that I knew I could do well and I enjoyed. So uh, God, I think, just had the, the right uh, sense of timing for me. Well, I think it was a real blessing for me to, to start with the Steelers organization because Coach Noel had the right philosophy about how to do it and how to coach, and he transmitted that to all of us, and he lived that. So many people say, oh, well, life should be about faith, family, and then your job, but they don't live that out, and, and he did. He made sure that we understood that family was important. He gave us time away. He was, he was unlike many of the coaches that I could have worked for. He gave me that foundation of, of how you can do it and, and be successful and still honor the Lord. And so I, I was really, really blessed to have that. Also, the, the thing that he did for me is he said, be yourself. I hired you because of what I saw in you. Don't change. Don't tr even try to be like him. Uh, be yourself. Don't worry about what anybody else says. You coach your way. And the, the other thing he told me, that uh, was really important in, in my development. Uh, I had not really coached before, and I was very young, 25, so I, I asked him the first day, what am I supposed to do? What's my job? And he said, you know, your job as a coach, it's very simple, help your players be better. And he meant that in all ways, not just on the field, not just better athletes, but help them be better men. But it was very simple, build relationships, get to know them, find out what they need, find out how you can help them, and then deliver that. And so it wasn't just, hey, one way to do it, my way or the highway, but no, you've got you've to find out how you can help everybody be better. So that became my philosophy, that number one, that uh, faith and family was important, that yes, I was going to coach and put a lot into it, but uh, I wasn't going to neglect those two things. And then number two, uh, I was going to try to create an atmosphere, whether it was me coaching five individual players that I had or a defensive unit or eventually an entire team. I was going to try to create that culture, that environment where we all worked together and we all tried to, to help each other be better. And not everybody thought that was a, the best way to do it. It, it was maybe somewhat counter-cultural at the time. Uh, and then you add to the fact that um, once I let people know that I was a Christian, I felt I had to coach that way all the time. And again, that wasn't necessarily the norm in the National Football League. And as I moved up the ladder, some people weren't quite ready for that. Well, we've never seen a coach that doesn't really yell. We've never seen a coach that doesn't use profanity. How are you gonna motivate these guys? How are you gonna keep them in line? And um, I had to prove to people that um, you could do that and do it in a Christian manner. And that was fun in a lot of ways, but uh, sometimes you felt like you were going against the grain a little bit. But I made a decision I was gonna be different. And um, 
Not everybody was ready for that. Uh, I remember my first meeting with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers when I got the job uh, in 1996 as the head coach and I introduced myself and we talked about how we're going to do things and I told the guys, you know, you just need to know this. I'm a Christian. Uh, I'm going to coach you with respect. I'm going to be very demanding, but it's probably going to be in a different way. Uh, I'm not going to yell at you, I hope, and I'm not going to use profanity, but let me just find out, is there anybody out there who needs that? Do you need me to yell at you and curse at you to play your best? And I didn't see any hands raised. So I said, okay, I think we can proceed then. Now don't tell me down the road that you know I'm not doing it the right way or the best way. You've all told me you don't need that. And everybody kind of laughed and chuckled about it. And it took them a while to, to get the feel of it. But after about three years, uh, we had veteran guys that would tell the young guys, don't mess this up. We got a good coach here. We got a good thing going. Make sure you do the right thing. We, we want to play for him for a long time. I wanted to help some young guys grow. And at that time, there weren't a lot of African-American assistant coaches and, and certainly not guys on the top level. So that became something that was a, a hard issue of mine. I wanted to help some young men maybe get their first step into the National Football League, but also help some guys grow as, as my mentors had helped me. So uh, I was pretty intentional about that, about hiring young people with talent, but also empowering them, giving them positions, creating assistant head coach positions, and uh, kind of helping those guys get going. And so guys who ended up leaving our staff and going on, Herm Edwards coached the Jets and the Chiefs to the playoffs. Lovey Smith coached the Bears to the Super Bowl. Mike Tomlin coached the, the Steelers to the Super Bowl. And they felt comfortable that they could do it that way and have family days at, at practice and not have to use profanity and still get the job done. And to me, to see those guys go on and succeed and kind of carry that tradition on Jim Caldwell, took the, the Colts to a Super Bowl after I left. Um, that, that's been an awesome feeling for me to have those guys show the world that, you know what, you can honor the Lord and you can be openly uh, expressive about your faith and still be excellent. And I, I carried that on with me for the next 28 years. When I was young and I would dream, you, you dream about making it to the National Football League, you dream about being in the Super Bowl or scoring the winning touchdown some way. And I, I had some crazy dreams that way, but I never really dreamed about being a coach and I never dreamed some of the things that happened. You know, being the first African-American coach to win a Super Bowl, uh, going in the NFL Hall of Fame, uh, meeting four presidents <laughs> because you're winning Super Bowls, Never thought about those kind of things, but I think God just allowed it to happen, blessed me in a lot of ways, and some things that I can look back on now and say, wow, um, we, we won our Super Bowl in, in Indianapolis, and I was the first uh, African-American coach to lead a, a Super Bowl team. My daughter was going to Spelman College, historically black college at the time, and she called me after the game and said one of her professors uh, talked about it that, hey, Jackie Robinson and Martin Luther King, this is what we we're kind of looking for, and now your dad's in that same category. And I was like, no, I'm not in the same category as Jackie Robinson and Martin Luther King. But then you stop and think about it, well, 20 years from now, you know, it, it will be that kind of question. And it, it's pretty amazing. Um, I'm, I'm thankful, I'm grateful. God takes you through things and you grow from them. And then you look back and you say, oh, that, that wasn't that big a deal, but at the time it was monumental. God is he's giving you little trials to get you through, but, but you're gonna keep your focus on him. I think the one thing that did happen to us, uh, 2005, we lost our son. And that's something now that really, you say, gosh, can I handle this? And where is God and am I still going to be faithful? So even in that situation, uh, my wife and I and our family could say, yeah, it, it hurts, but you know, God's still there and he's got a reason for us to move forward and he's going to use us. 
you know, we're talking about the pandemic and everything that was going on and people searching for answers. Well, there's a passage in here from July 17th, right? As this pandemic was kind of taking root. And to me, it, it really speaks of a lot of things uh, that, that we could take and uh, a lot of uh, lessons right here in just one day's reading. And it goes like this. Come away with me for a while. The world, with its nonstop demands, can be put on hold. Most people put me on hold, rationalizing that someday they will find time to focus on me. But the longer people push me into the background of their lives, the harder it is for them to find me. You live among people who glorify busyness. They have made time a tyrant that controls their lives. Even those who know me as Savior tend to march to the temple of the world. They have bought into the illusion that more is always better, more meetings, more programs, more activity. I have called you to follow me on a solitary path, making time alone with me your highest priority and deepest joy. It is a pathway largely unappreciated and often despised. However, you have chosen the better thing, which will never be taken away from you. Moreover, as you walk close to me, I can bless others through you. We think we've got to do all these things. Go here, go there. I've got to take care of this. And God was just saying, stop. Stop for a minute and come to me. Put me first and everything else is going to be okay. Uh, television has given me a great platform uh, to not only talk about the game and, and encourage people to watch, but it's also given me the ability to talk about other things. Uh, right now, we're certainly talking about social justice. We're talking about communities and, and uh, making communities better. So it's given me a great platform. But again, I think I can represent the Lord there in highlighting other people and helping uh, America see some of the things that our players do that nobody really knew about. And I can highlight their inner character, uh, as well as tell people about the game on the field. And I, I can take Christ to my job here as well. And it's not always what people want to hear. And I've gotten pushback on that. Um, we broadcast Super Bowl 52. Um, the Eagles were playing um, the New England Patriots. And my job was to cover the Eagles that week. And Nick Foles was their quarterback. It was a great story. Uh, he had replaced the starting quarterback and led Philadelphia to the Super Bowl. And I interviewed him. And he was just sharing with me his relationship with Christ and why he was playing and how he's looking forward to the game. And I went on the, the pregame Super Bowl broadcast. And I said, I think Nick Foles is going to have a great game because he really feels like God's got him there for a reason. He's relaxed. He's relying on the Holy Spirit. And man, people, how you shouldn't talk about religion on the show. This is about sports and the Super Bowl. Uh, but I can, with good conscience, say I was doing my job because that's exactly what he said. He rewarded me by going out and becoming the MVP of the game and playing great football and giving honor to Jesus Christ after the game. Uh, but I just felt like God had me there right for that moment. And Christ is so much a part of my life that if I can just help steer someone else, anyone, towards Jesus. It's, it's very important. Truth always wins, and we, we can't be afraid of sharing the truth. To learn more about the work Coach Dungy does with nonprofit organizations, check out his social media platforms. You can also see him featured on the cover of the Winter 2021 Jesus Calling magazine. The Jesus Calling magazine is available at most Books A Million locations or at Mardell Christian stores. You can also visit jesuscalling.com slash magazine to view the magazine digitally and find out how to subscribe. 2020 has brought a lot of challenges to many of our lives, but none more than our country's first responders. The team at Jesus Calling has chosen 100 Jesus Calling devotions that have been specially selected for those heroes in our midst. There are hardcover editions of these 100 devotions for medical professionals, firefighters, law enforcement, and the armed forces. Find these Jesus Calling for First Responders editions exclusively at christianbook.com.
Sam Acho knows the value of being real in a world filled only with highlight reels. Sam watched his parents live out their strong faith as they served every summer in their native Nigeria, offering free medical care to people who needed it. But as he began to find more fame and success as an NFL linebacker, Sam began to lose touch with his roots, sharing only the successful version of himself he thought people wanted to see. It wasn't until Sam lost a mentor and his identity as a player that he realized God loved him just as he was. So my name is Sam Acho. I'm a NFL linebacker, a speaker, a podcaster, and also the author of the new book, Let the World See You. My parents were born and raised in Nigeria. They moved to America in their early 20s and they started a new life and started to live the American dream. I was born in Dallas, Texas. My dad was going to school at Dallas Theological Seminary and he was also a pastor and my mom was a nurse and just working and working and they both, now my dad is a, he has a PhD in psychology. So he's a marriage counselor. He also pastors a church in Dallas called Living Hope Bible Fellowship Church. And then my mom went back to school after all the kids grew up and got her doctorate in nurse practitioning. So she's a DNP now. For me growing up, I uh, grew up in in Dallas. I'm, I have two older sisters and a younger brother, played sports, went to school, loved and still love academics, love learning, um, but also athletics as well. And also, like I said, going to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, really getting to know Jesus in the household. I didn't know football was something I wanted to do I, I was just in sports. I was playing football, basketball, track, all the different sports, baseball, and just having fun. And And I, I started getting better and better, not only at football, but at basketball. And I always say if I would have grown taller, I may have been in the NBA. But yeah, I stopped at six foot three. And so decided to play football. And interestingly enough, the summer before my senior year, I went to a football camp at the University of Southern California. Back then, USC was a perennial powerhouse. They were and won two or three national championships in a row. They had people of the likes of Reggie Bush and Matt Liner. Pete Carroll was the coach. And we were in Texas, but my younger brother heard about this camp in California. And he said, hey, we should go. And so we had some family friends in California. So we decided to make it a family trip. So we go to California over the summer and you know, we show up at this camp. And what we didn't realize was that it was an invite only camp. And we weren't invited. We weren't invited. and. And for whatever reason, they they let us in. And not only was it an invite-only camp, but it was also their top 300 camps. So the 300 best players from the state of California were all at this camp. And so I show up, and I guess I did really well because Coach Pete Carroll, the head coach of the team, called up me and five other guys out of that 300 up to his office and essentially offered us scholarships on the spot. You know, they, well, I call, get called up to Pete Carroll's office, and he says, Sam, you did a great job, really impressed. We love what we saw. And and they said, okay, well, here, we have another top 300 camp coming up in a couple weeks from now. And so we really like you and these other guys, so we're going to give you a call back to offer you a scholarship. And I said, okay, well, thanks, great, this is exciting. And as I'm walking out of his door, I stopped. I said, oh, coach, one quick thing. You said you're going to call in a couple weeks. Well, in about two weeks, I, I go to Nigeria on this medical missions trip. And so if you call and I don't pick up, it's not because I don't like you, it's because I don't have service. I'm in a rural village in Nigeria, so that, that's why. He says, okay, Sam, don't worry, we'll be in touch. Growing up, I always saw my parents every summer since I was born. <laughs> they would leave for two weeks to go to Nigeria. They would go and they would give free medicine and surgeries for people in need, people from rural villages that don't have access to anything. People don't have light. They don't have running water. Well, lo and behold, two weeks later, I'm in the airport getting ready to go through security and, and, you know, get on the plane and my phone rings. And it's Ken Norton Jr. who's the recruiting coordinator at USC. Hey, Sam, this is Ken Norton Jr. How are you doing? I say, hey, coach, I'm doing great. Thanks for calling. He said, hey, Sam, we really like what you saw. We didn't want to, We decided we don't want to wait until the other top 300 camp. We want to offer you right now. I said, wait, what? He said, yes, I've got Coach Carroll right here, right next to me. We want you to verbally commit. All you have to do is tell Coach that I want to be a Trojan, a USC Trojan. I want to be a Trojan. And I said, well, how does this work? But, but, but here's Coach. He gives Coach the phone. And so we kind of have a little bit of small talk, catching up. How are you doing? How's the fam? And after a while, Coach says, well, Sam, is there anything you would like to say? And I say, well, Coach. I would love the opportunity to one day 
think about the potential of maybe being a Trojan. Coach, I got to go. The plane's taking off. And I hang up the phone on Pete Carroll. Hang up the phone. And I remember getting on that flight thinking I've made the worst decision of my life. Can I call them back? What have I done? But something in my spirit wasn't sitting well. I just felt like it wasn't the right decision. Well, I go to Nigeria, as I mentioned, no service. We're just going, we're serving the people there. We come back and about 10 days later and when we get off the plane, my phone just starts to just buzz off, just ring off the hook. And I look and I see 50 missed calls and 30 some odd voicemails from coaches all around the country. They had found out that USC had offered me a scholarship and also my highlight tape had got put on this recruiting website called Rivals. And so I came back from that trip and after turning down USC, every other door I could have imagined was opened. USC and many other schools want their players to commit right on the spot. If we offer you, this offer comes with an expiration date. That's oftentimes the thought process. Well, for whatever reason, Texas, they hadn't offered me to that point. Mac Brown, the head coach at the time, was on vacation. He only gets two weeks out of the year to be on vacation. And during those two weeks, you do not call Coach Brown. And so, well, those same two weeks were the same two weeks that I was getting calls from every coach around the country. Finally, one of the assistant coaches called Coach Brown on his vacation. Coach picks up. He says, hey, this better be good. They say, Coach, it is. We got a guy named Sam. You might want to look into him. They send him the highlight tape. He watches it. They invite me over. I guess he cut his vacation short. They invite me over to campus. I go and visit campus. And and as I walk on campus, I'm greeted not only by some of the Nigerian players on the team, guys like Brian Arakpo, who went on to go play, be a first round pick in the NFL and play for many years, Chris Obanaya, many guys on that team who are Nigerian, but also I was met by Mac Brown and his wife, Sally. So you got to imagine it's me. It's my mom. It's my dad. My younger brother came as well. It's Mac Brown and his wife, Sally. And not only do they welcome us with open arms, but they actually apologize. Sam, we're sorry for taking so long. And I know many schools would want you to verbally commit. And they say you have a week or you have a month or you have a day. Sam, take as long as you need. Take as long as you need. And as soon as they said that, that, that's when I knew that was Texas was the place I needed to be. One of my friends, my next door neighbor, actually, his name is Jerry Price, and he became more than a neighbor, more than a friend. He became a mentor to me and his wife, Judy, became a mentor to my wife. Judy and Jerry had been married for 40 some odd years, happily married with had kids and grandkids. They would throw parties for their friends. They would hold hands, go on dates. And I wanted that. I wanted that to be me when I was 65 and, 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 and almost 70 like Judy and Jerry. And so he just became this man who I stayed really close to and learned from. Well, fast forward, I'd moved from my time in Arizona where he was my neighbor. I'd gone on to Chicago. I was playing with the Bears. And all of a sudden, I see a message on Facebook, a post, actually, a Facebook post from Jerry Price asking for permission to leave. He'd been battling cancer for years and it wasn't getting better. And he was ready to go see Jesus. He was ready to go home. He was about 70 years old at the time. And he knew it was his time to go. And so I call him and I just ask him to give me, I said, Jerry, give me what you got. I don't feel like I'm in a position to give you permission, but I just need some advice. I used to always go to your house and get words of wisdom. Please share something with me, anything that you've learned about me or about life. Just talk to me. And he says, Sam, there's two things I want you to know. He said, number one, the most important thing you can do on this earth is to get to know Jesus intimately. He said, God takes no greater joy than when you get to know Jesus and you will get no greater joy in your life than getting to know Jesus intimately. And then he paused. And I waited, I waited, I waited. What's next? What's the next piece of advice? What is next? And he said, Sam, the second thing I want you to know is that you are worth getting to know. Never forget that you are worth getting to know. And those would be the last words I heard from my friend, Jerry. He would go on to die peacefully in his sleep a few days later, I actually flew out from where I was to go visit him. And by the time I got to him, it was moments too late. But Jerry meant a lot to me. And I think we all have, and if we don't have, we need Jerry prices in our lives. People who've gone before us, who can guide us, mentor us, teach us, advise us, be friends to us, encourage us in our times of deepest need.
his Jerry's words about getting to know Jesus and also me being worth getting to know spoke powerfully to me because we were created for relationship. We were created to love. I've made money and I've been around people who have made money. The things that you think about acquiring, I've either had them or I've seen people who have had them. And many of those people are empty. So for this man to say that the most important thing you can do, and this man had done a lot of those things. He was in the in circles in a lot of ways. And I had things you could imagine, worldly wealth or whatever you want to call it. For him to say at 70 years old, lived a full life to say there's nothing of greater value than getting to know Jesus. That meant something because it's it's true. God creates us for relationship. And I saw this as I was living my life. The, the times where I was at my best was when I was in relationship, not only with others, but with Jesus, letting him get to know me. And then also the second piece of advice of me being worth getting to know that resonated because I don't think a lot of people believe that they are worth getting to know. I think a lot of people think that, well, people want to know me because of my fame or my what I can provide to them or because of the masks that I put on or the way I pretense that I put up on social media. People may want to know me because of that, but if they knew the real me, they wouldn't want to get to know me. And Jerry reminded me and anyone listening, no, you are worth getting to know. Your pains, your joys, your fears, your hurts, all of you, you're worth getting to know. Why? Because you're already fully seen, fully known, and fully loved by Jesus. The epiphany moment for me, the moment when I realized that I was wearing the mask was actually when I got released from the Chicago Bears. I've never been released in my life, never been cut, been fired from anything. It's been, I've been, things have been going great. And all of a sudden I remember getting released and it wasn't the release that hurt. It was, I went to go say goodbye to one of, one of my friends and she's the assistant to, you know, she works up in the office. I said, Hey Katie, she said, Hey Sam, how are you doing? I said, Hey, I'm doing good. And I was kind of talking with a smile on my face. I said, Hey Katie, just want to let you know that I, I just want to say bye. I just got released. And I said it with a smile, right? You know, because I'm usually smiling and laughing and always got it together. And I and I told her that. And she did a double take. She said, wait, what? Hold on. Say that one more time, Sam. I said, yeah, I just I just got released from the bear. So I just want to say bye. and Thank you for everything. She said, no, no. She said, Sam, I, I'm sorry. I thought you were, you know, I was looking at your face as you were talking to me and you were smiling. I thought you were telling me good news. Sam, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry for your for your loss. It has to be devastating. And I realized at that moment, and that had been a buildup for moments before, that I had been pretending. You know, months before, I had just signed a, a big contract going on my eighth year in the NFL. I was living the dream. And On the outside, things looked like they were going great, but I wasn't. I didn't believe I was worth getting to know. The real me. Friendships, relationships. Do you really want me because of the things that I have or you really want me because of me? And I remember sitting down with a friend a week before training camp. This is months before I got released as that buildup began. And sharing with him how I was struggling and I wasn't doing well and I wasn't, I felt like I wasn't the man I was supposed to be and the husband, the father friend it wasn't it just wasn't me and I remember telling him that I was just waiting for the season to start and once we get back to football I'll be okay right? we get back to work and he looked at me and he said Sam if that's how you feel right now he said I'm afraid of what happens when when football ends for you for when you retire I'm really concerned and as I'm sharing with him some of my struggles I began to cry And he looked at me in my tears as I was crying. He didn't judge me. He didn't turn his back on me. He actually looked at me. He saw me and he said, he said, by the way, Sam, it's really nice to see you. I'm thinking, what do you mean nice to see? What do you mean nice to see you? He said, I've known you for almost a decade now and I've never seen this side of you. It's good to see that you're human. So that was the moment the beginning and the end of the taking off the mask. Right around this time where everything you're hearing about happened with me being seen and known, I stumbled upon Jesus Calling by Sarah Young and every single day I would read it and it would really encourage and remind me, oh wow, I am worth getting to know. Oh, Jesus does see me and know me, even in my ups and my downs and the pain and the injuries and the setbacks and being released and not getting the playing time I wanted and not not getting the contract I wanted 
in arguments and disagreements, God still sees the best in me. So my faith in Jesus and some good people around me and Jesus calling the, the devotional really got me through a really tough time. It's funny for me during that season of life, from that conversation with that friend that I just spoke of to being released, so much happened during that time and my faith held me through. Uh, you know, anytime I sign autographs, whether on a book or on a football, I always autograph the verse Hebrews 11.1, 1, which says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Sam's book, Let the World See You, is available wherever books are sold. If you'd like to hear more stories about athletes who put their faith first, check out our interviews with Lolo Jones and Evander Holyfield. Next time on the Jesus Calling podcast, we speak with neurological ICU nurse and New York Times bestselling author, Tana Amen. After she moved through a childhood filled with trauma and suffered with an eating disorder, Tana was determined to work her way to a life of success. But as she struggled through a painful divorce, she felt her carefully constructed facade begin to crumble and she began to spiral. I was going through this custody battle. I was a single mom. I was under so much stress, but I had to have it together. I owned my own home. I had a good job and I would paint my face every day and do my hair. And everyone thought that I had it completely together, but on the inside, I was a complete mess. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com Jesus Calling Book on Facebook and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.